Well, good morning. Good morning. Glad to be here. Uh, I bring you greetings from Oxford, Mississippi. Um, got back from there yesterday about 6 o'clock. Um, I uh, went there with my wife on Friday. And Saturday, all day Saturday, uh, did a seminar for them. And then I preached three times on Sunday. So if, if I get into the wrong lesson, um, you'll understand why. My brain's uh, still in Oxford, I think. Uh, but... Um, Glad to be back. Glad to be uh, ready to jump back into Hebrews. We're going to be in chapter 10 today, and we're going to cover the whole chapter. Uh, so you can open up, up, up your Bibles to there. Uh, by way of reminder, we're going to uh, have four more weeks of this series, and then we'll be done. And then we'll take a short break, and we're going to come back uh, latter part of May, and we're going to do the book of Galatians. And then in the fall, we will do the book of Job. So if you want to get ready for that, you think your life sucks. Um, read, read Job's life. Uh, go, go back and read Job. But uh, we're going to take a jump into that. It's going to be a, a barn burner because it's uh, 40 plus chapters. But it's a great book. And uh, it's a great book about our God. That's really, it's not about Job. It's about Job's God. So that's kind of where we're going. But this morning we're going to jump into uh, Hebrews chapter 10. So let me pray for us and we'll get started. Lord, I thank you for these men, and I pray that as we open up this chapter uh, that we would see you and we would see the glorious nature of your son's gift of his own life, the shedding of his own blood so that we might have redemption, so that we might have um, complete forgiveness of sin. All our guilt is taken away. All these things are true in Christ, and so, Father, would you help us to recognize it, um, rejoice in it, live like we believe it. And, and let it change the way we live our lives right here, right now. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to get together as men. Uh, would you speak to us powerfully this morning? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So one of the things that I want to encourage you guys in is that I know this is a deep book, and it's, uh, it's got a lot of Old Testament stuff in it. We're talking about the tabernacle. We're talking about the Holy of Holies. And we're talking about sacrifice. But I, I hope you see that the, the reason the author is going to such uh, depth and the reason he's dealing with all of these things is so that you might be encouraged, so you might be exhorted to believe everything that Jesus Christ has done for you. One of the phrases we're going to see today is once for all. And that phrase is going to have to do that what Jesus Christ did on the cross was once for all, it, one time for all time. And the reason I think that's so important is because we have a habit of crucifying Jesus again and again and again. And what I mean by that is that we really don't believe his sins covered everything once for all. And so we, we go back and we think we have more that we need to do and we got to fix this and we got to fix that and we haven't done enough. And, and in doing so, we're really doing, as the author says, trampling the blood of Christ. Because his, his sacrifice was sufficient. It was once for all. And so what we're going to see in chapter 10 is this idea that what Jesus Christ did was enough. And he's going to, once again, jump back into the Old Testament. And he's going to use a quote from a psalm of David. And I want to begin there. Because I think we need to understand this psalm before we understand why he's bringing it into his discussion of these things. The author has a habit of going back into the Old Testament scriptures and bringing them to the forefront. And he's going to do it here, but he be begins with this psalm, Psalm 51, written by David. And it says this, For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices are God, or a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Now this is David writing this psalm, and he's, in a sense, seems to be diminishing, de denigrating the sacrificial system. He says, that's not really what you want. And yet, this is a guy who took part in the sacrificial system. He brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. He, he, he was all about the sacrificial system, but he knew that behind it all was this, a broken and contrite heart. That's what God's looking for. It's a Psalm of David. It's a Psalm of David, according to the subscript, of this psalm, it says this, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So, so you got to keep the context. When was this psalm written? You know the story of David and Bathsheba, right? He's up on his rooftop. The scripture says it's the time of year when all the kings go to battle. 
but he's not in battle. His men are, but he's on the rooftop of his palace. He looks down, he sees Bathsheba, and she's taking a bath. I always wondered as a kid, you know, what's she doing that for? Well, it was pretty common in that day that they would have baths on the roof of their house. And then it begs the question, how many times has David seen her do this? Probably a lot. I don't think this was a rare thing. I don't think this was a one, one time only thing. But he sees her and he sends someone to get her. He sleeps with her. He gets her pregnant. And then he realizes that I got a problem. She's pregnant. Her husband's off at war. And so he sends for Uriah, tries to get him drunk. So he'll go in and have sex with his wife. And it'll look like he got her pregnant. He refuses to. And so he has him killed on the battlefield. And then he marries Bathsheba. That's when he wrote this. So he's committed an incredibly grievous sin in the eyes of God, and he knows it. He knows what he's done. And the prophet, though, Nathan, has to come to him because he's not yet confessed it. He's got her living with him. He's moving on with a charade. He's letting everybody think, well, he did come back. Uriah did come back. He probably did sleep with his wife, and this is her baby. But God knows. Nathan now knows. David knows. And David, because he's confronted by the prophet, confesses his sin. He knows it's wrong. That's the context of this thing. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And what's unique here is that he doesn't say I sinned against Bathsheba or I sinned against Uriah. He's not saying he didn't. He's just saying my real sin was against God Almighty. I have offended Almighty God and God forgave him. Great story, except it doesn't end there. If you remember the story, other things happen. Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. And at that point, if we stop right there, this is a wonderful ending to a really bad story. This guy did something to offend a holy God. He's confessed it. And God says, I've put away your sin. It's the same picture that we've seen in Hebrews. God removes our sin and and separates it from us as far as the east is from the west. And he says, you shall not die. But, there's always a but, there's consequences. What are the consequences? Nathan announces that nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. This is rough. I don't care who you are, how cold your heart may be, this is a rough one to read and go, wow. This innocent baby is going to suffer because of the sins of David. But see, God has to deal with sin. And it's this that prompts the psalm. The child does die. And yet David's able to write this psalm. And what does he write in the psalm? He writes that he knows that what God wants at the end of the day is not an animal sacrifice, right? It's not the blood of bulls and goats. He could have gone to the temple. He could have offered a sacrifice. And he probably did for his sins. And yet he knows that's insufficient. It's not enough. That's not going to help. This is David writing long before, long after the Mosaic law was given and long before we get to the first century AD when this letter is written. And yet he knows that that can't cover his sin. No amount of blood of bulls and goats was going to take care of what he did. He, He was forgiven, but there were consequences and he couldn't cover it up with just going through ritual sacrifices. At no point does he say, well, wait, God, I I went to the temple. I I offer this, I offer that. Of course, there was no temple at this point because his son hadn't built it. But there was a ark in Shiloh. There was a tabernacle erected in Shiloh. There was the sacrificial system available to him. And he probably did avail himself of it, but he knew it wasn't going to cover what he had done because God demands more. What does he realize that God wants? A heart change. Here's the deal. You can't change your heart. I can't change my heart. And we can't change one another's hearts. It's impossible. I I can't make you any different than you already are. I can talk to you. I can advise you. I I can encourage you. But I can't change your heart. Every couple that's ever come to me for marriage counseling, that's the first thing I tell them. I can't fix your marriage. Guess what? You can't fix it either. It's a God deal. God's going to have to change your heart. And God's going to have to change her, her heart. Her heart because I can't do it. And that's what David realizes, that he needed heart change. He needed God to do something in his heart, because that's the thing that God's looking for. 
And what jumps out at me at this is that David is just one guy along the, the history of Israel that is showing us that this whole sacrificial thing is not working. It's not doing what they need it to do. It, it, it can't change the heart. And really, I think what happened with the loss of that child, it, it brought David to a place of heart change that he realized the weight and the scope of what he had done. It grieved him. It, 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 he, he grieved for a long period of time. And even his servants and friends would come and, and say, come on, you got, you got to snap out of it. You got to move on with your life. It, it, it was powerful. But God is sick of business as usual. He's sick of all those heartless rituals that they're going through because he knows the people, yes, they're offering sacrifices. They're doing everything he told them to do, but their heart's not in it. It's just all by rote. It's all just going through the motions. And that is unacceptable to God. It's like you showing up for church on Sunday, but your heart's not in it. You really don't want to be there. Your wife had to make you come, you know, I'm glad you show up and God can still speak to you even if you don't have the heart for it, but God would prefer you come joyfully, willingly, eagerly. That's what he's looking for. Otherwise, what happens? It becomes nothing but ritual and routine. I don't want my wife to love me that way because she has to, or it's just expected. I want it to be real. I want it to be from the heart. I don't want it to be something she just goes through the motions day in and day out. But that's what a lot of us do in our marriages, but we also do it in our relationship with God. That's what the people of Israel were doing by the time we get to the first century. See, in Jeremiah, it says, your burnt offerings are not acceptable. Who's saying this? God. Who's he speaking to? The people of Israel. And, and again, this is long after David, so we're fast forwarding in the history of Israel to the point of Jeremiah the prophet coming along and God says, your burnt offerings are not acceptable, your sacrifices are not pleasing to me. I, I'm not gonna put up with them, I'm not gonna accept, accept them. Isaiah, another prophet, I've had enough of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls and, or of lambs or of goats. Well, wait a minute, God, that's what you told us to do. Why, why, why don't you delight? Because your heart's not in it. I don't need blood of bulls and goats. I need your heart to be changed. I need you to have a right attitude towards me, and you don't. So I've had enough. I'm sick of it. I, I'm done with it. He goes on in Amos, I hate, I despise your feasts, your festivals, your, your celebrations that I ordain I put on the calendar, told you to keep them, but you know what? They nauseate me. I'm sick of them. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. That's a scary thought, right? If you're living, living by a legalistic system that I have to do these things in order to gain favor with God, and God goes, well, you can do it, but I will not accept it, then you're kind of doomed, right? But that's exactly what God is saying in the latter parts of the history of the people of Israel before the kingdom falls apart completely and he sends the northern kingdom into Assyria into captivity and then four, 300, 400 years later, he sends the southern kingdom into Babylon. He says, I hate it, I despise it. So here we are with a letter written to Jews living in the first century and has anything changed in Israel? Now, remember, this is the century in which Jesus Christ came. Has anything changed? Have, have the Israelites gotten their act together from the days of David all the way down to Amos and Malachi? No, the answer is no. They're no better at this. They're not contrite. Their, their, their hearts have not really changed. They're not really that excited about worshiping God. They're going through the motions. They're, they're showing up at the temple. They're doing the things they're supposed to do. Remember, Jesus showed up at the temple. He saw what was going on. He even cleansed the temple on two different occasions because of the things going on. Their hearts had not really changed. And God was no more pleased with them than he was with the people in David's day. What's he, what's he always been looking for? Heart change. Is your heart in it? See, Jesus didn't think they had changed because Jesus had some pretty harsh words. 
Jesus said, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce. He's taking Isaiah's words and he's bringing them into the first century and saying, this is still true. It's true of you Israelites. It's true of you Jews who are worshiping at the temple. Your, your worship's a farce for they teach man-made ideas as the commands of God. Things had not changed. Richard Phillips says, these warnings do not condemn the sacrifices themselves, but the hypocrisy of those who simply went through the motions without any heart involvement. What does God want from you? What does God want from me? our hearts, that we truly do want to spend time with him, but that we truly do want to worship, that we truly do love him and are grateful to him for everything that he's done for us. Richard Phillips goes on and says, even though God established the sacrifices of animals, these were not God's true desire. They're just a state, they're, they're not a statement of the solution, but of the problem. What the author of Hebrews has said over and over again is those things only pointed to something to come. And they had to be done over and over and over again because they could not do what Jesus Christ did, which is what redeem our hearts, change our hearts. So that brings us to chapter 10. He's going to quote from this Psalm, Psalm 51, in just a second. But he starts out saying, for since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. Well, we saw this in chapter nine, right? It can't cleanse your conscience. It can't change your heart. It's outward. Everything about the old covenant is outward, but it points to the good things to come. It points to there is a day coming and the day has come when Jesus Christ came to this earth, when you can have your heart changed. You can have your conscience cleansed, but those things can't do it. They're a shadow. They're a picture. They're, they're a, a vague outline of the better thing to come. That's what we've been talking about for weeks, right? The true form, the real form. And notice what he says, it can never make perfect. And I know you're tired of hearing this, but who's he writing to? Jews who've accepted Jesus as their Messiah. They're struggling with where is he? Why hasn't he brought his kingdom? Why are we suffering? And they're thinking about going back to Judaism, legalism, the law sacrifices so that they might wait for the real Messiah to show up. And he's trying to convince them, don't do that. Because that, the old way, can't make perfect. It can't change your heart. What did David say? The very same thing. That way, the old way, the blood of bulls and goats can't change the heart. It can't make perfect. What you want is a contrite, a changed heart, a heart that only God can change. So the problem is still incredibly serious, right? He says, you need to be made perfect. And yet that can't make you perfect. So now what are you gonna do? And the word really just means to be made complete, whole. Everything about you <clears throat> as it's supposed to be. Carried through to completion. If you go back to that, if you go to legalism of any kind, Judaism, any kind of religion, it will never get you where you need to go. What is want, yet wanting in order to be full? See, we all need to be completed. We all need to be made whole, but you can't do it through legalism. You can't do it through effort. You can't do it through self. You gotta do it through Christ. And that's what he's trying to tell them. And he's saying, you have done that. You've placed your faith in the Messiah but you're not willing to wait for him to finish what he began. He will perfect you. He will finish what he began. But if you go backwards, it's not going to accomplish anything. So all of these sacrifices, all these things in the past, and again, we, we look at that and go, well, we don't do that. We don't offer those kind of sacrifices. I don't have any interest in sacrificing blood of bulls and goats, but we do go back to legalism pretty easily. If I can just do this, if I can just please God, if I can do one more thing, what is it you want me to do and I'll do it? Write it down. That's why we like sermons that end with three tips to this and four helps for that. And if you will do these things, you will be this. We love that because just tell me what I'm supposed to do. That's legalism. It's, it's not you doing stuff for God. It's you resting in what God has done for you through Jesus Christ. See, it's all about atonement, being made right with God, having your sins cleansed and purified, 
your heart made right with God. And there was the old system, right? But the animal sacrifices never were intended to do what only Jesus Christ can do. That's what this is all about. That's what the entire book is about. And chapter 10 is going to go into it in great detail. He says, those things don't bring me pleasure. They, they don't bring me joy. They don't bring me comfort. Why? Because they can't make you perfect. They, they can't do what needs to be done. And I never intended for them to do. All they can do is produce guilt. Remember, we've seen this before from the letters of Paul. Why was the law given? To show you your sin and to show you you stand guilty before a God, a holy God, a righteous God. That's all the law can do, but they can't even prevent sin. In chapter seven of Romans, Paul writes, you know, I know what I want to do, but I keep doing what I don't want to do. And he's got this dilemma of, I know it's right, but I just can't do it. And that's the thing that we face if we don't rely on what Christ has done. All of these things are true. There, there's no end to sacrifices, right? Because there's no end to sin. We can't stop sinning. And so we got to just keep offering sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. So what do we need? A better sacrifice. See, that's what he's telling these people. But it's in the scripture and it's divinely ordained. So he's trying to tell you and me too, right? There has been a better sacrifice. But isn't it interesting how quickly we go to another sacrifice, our sacrifice, if I would just do this, he'd love me. If I would just do this, he'd bless me. If I would remember to please him with these activities, then God would do more things for me, but he's not. So therefore I must not have added up all the stuff I need to do right. I, I, there's, there's something missing. I need to do more. And there are so many people who live with that burden of, okay, God, my life's not where it needs to be. I, I don't seem to have the joy, the contentment, the, the satisfaction. What else do I need to do? to get from you what I want from you. That's legalism. It's certainly not living by grace. So he goes on and says, consequently, when Christ came, remember he's, he's writing to people who are Christians, but they're struggling with their faith. They're, they're struggling with the gospel. They're struggling with the good news because the good news has not turned out too good. It's turned out kind of bad. They're, they're struggling, they're suffering, they're under persecution. But he says, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired but a body you have prepared for me. The very beginning of that is for this reason. Therefore, Christ came. Because the law can't work, Christ came. Because the blood of bulls and goats can't cleanse, can't purify the conscience, can't fix the heart, Christ came. And then it says, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. He's quoting from what? Psalm 51. He's saying that what David said are my words, my words. But he says, I came to do your will, O God, as it's written of me in the book, of the scroll of the book, I've come to do your will. See, this is what's important for us to understand. All of us know we need to do the will of God. We need to obey God. We need to uh, live in keeping with the will of God but that's not the thing that redeems you. That's not the thing that brings you forgiveness. That's not the thing that separates your sin as far as the East is from the West. It's the will that Christ obeyed. It's what he did. It's what he sacrificed on the cross so that you could have atonement. See, he's once again comparing the old with the new. The old way of atonement, the new way of atonement. God had a better plan. You know what's true about God all the time? He's always got a better plan. And here's what's also true. His plan is always better than your plan. It's always better. But think how many times you always go to your plan. Well, that doesn't seem to be working. God doesn't seem to know what he's doing. So I'm going to use my plan. That's just like as stupid as it comes. But I do it regularly, repeatedly. Well, God doesn't seem to be doing anything. He must need my help. We saw that in the life of Abraham and Sarah where, you know, God... You know, God doesn't seem to know she's barren and I'm old, so we're, we're going to help God out. Hey, go into my handmaiden. I'm all over it. You bet. Great idea, honey. How about Ishmael? Let's, let's use him. No, no. God says, I've got a plan and I'm going to work my plan and it's always the better plan. And this is what David is writing about. When he writes the psalm and 
the author of Hebrews is saying, those are really the words of Jesus. Jesus is the one who fixed it all. See, verses five through seven in Hebrews chapter 10 are quotes from Psalm 40, another Psalm of David. He's quoting from David, but he's saying these are actually the words of Jesus Christ. And he's saying Israel's greatest king was speaking of a greater king to come, one who is to come, the one who has come first century AD, the one who has come these people have placed their faith in, but now they're thinking about going away from him, going back to legalism, going back to self-effort. And yet David is predicting, prophesying about a king to come, a greater king than even him, who would be the servant king, the humble king, the obedient king, the suffering king. See, you could say all of these things are true of David, but only in a shadow form. He was a type of Christ, but he wasn't Christ. He... he we know he's not perfect because of the sin with Bathsheba and that he killed her husband. And there were other things that David did that didn't bring joy to God. But he's really talking about the king to come, king to come who would be the sanctifying king who would make all things right, including my heart, your heart. That's the king. And Jesus says, that's me. I am that one. Verse eight says, when he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. And again, he's taking Psalm 40, the words of David, he's applying them to Jesus. And Jesus is saying, God, Father, I know you don't take satisfaction in these things, the old way, the old law, the old covenant. That's not what pleases you. Then he's added, behold, I have come to do your will. Jesus came to do the will of God. And when he does, he does away with the first, the old way, the old covenant in order to establish the second, the new covenant. See, when Jesus came, we talked about this last week, it's as if his will was inaugurated by his death, his will and testament. And when it went into effect upon his death, everything he came to bring came. Everything we're owed came. Salvation, redemption, atonement, satisfaction with God. He's completely satisfied with you. He looks at you and sees you as righteous. He, he no longer sees your sins. He no longer, long, no longer condemns you. All of that became true because Jesus Christ did his will and he did away with the first. I have come to do your will and he brought the second, the new covenant, the better covenant because he did the will of God. John 6, 38 quotes Jesus as saying, I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me not to do my own will. And I am so glad that's true. What if Jesus had done his will? What if Jesus had said, when tempted in the, the wilderness by Satan, those three times where he said, you know what? I'll bow down to you. I'd like all the kingdoms of the world. Uh, he was hungry. Turn these stones into bread. I'm hungry. I'm going to eat some... If he had done any of those things, if he had given into any of those temptations, we wouldn't be here. And there would be no salvation available to any one of us. And there'd be no chance at being made right with God. But see, he didn't do his will. He did the will of his heavenly father. Later on, it says, Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. Do you know that he's not done yet? Well, wait, Ken, he said on the cross, it is finished. Yeah, his death, was complete, but he rose again and he ascended on high. And according to this book and many other books in the New Testament, he's coming back. He even told the disciples, if I don't go, I can't come back. I, I, I'm gonna come back. And that's what this is all about. That's the whole hope that we have is that one day he's gonna finish what he began and he's gonna come back. John 5.30, I can do nothing on my own. I judge as God tells me. Therefore, my judgment is just because I carry out the will of the one who sent me, not my own will. See, Jesus Christ did what no other man, no other high priest, no other king of Israel ever did. He completely obeyed the will of God. And because he did, we have heart change. We have access to heart change. And as soon as you place your faith in Jesus Christ, your heart is changed. See, wholehearted obedience is the sacrifice which God really desired, the sacrifice which he received in perfection from his servant son when he came into the world. Does anybody in this room wholeheartedly obey God right now? Don't raise your hand. We don't. 
See, this is pointing to Christ. He is the only one who is wholeheartedly obedient to God. Wasn't David, wasn't Abraham, wasn't Aaron the priest, it wasn't Moses, it wasn't Noah, it wasn't anybody but this God, Jesus Christ, who wholeheartedly, completely obeyed the will of God. He did what God called him to do. And because of that, we have hope. Over in 1 Samuel 15, 22, we get the same kind of terminology. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. This is Samuel the prophet speaking to King Saul, the first king of Israel, who had disobeyed the will of God multiple times. And then he tried to offer sacrifices. As, as a matter of fact, he offered them himself rather than allowing the priest to do it, which was in violation of the will and the law of God. And the prophet says, is that what God wants? You offering sacrifices or wouldn't it be better for you to just, just obey your God? And this led to his removal as king and his replacement by David. See, it's always been about obedience, but the problem is you and I cannot fully obey, can we? So why would we ever go back to legalism? Why would these people ever consider going back to the law, which they never kept to begin with, and they think they're going to go back and do it differently? See, the pattern of Israel is nobody's ever done it right. Nobody's ever obeyed the will of God, except who? Jesus Christ. And by that will, his will, the will of God, and, and fully obeying it, we've been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. See, he did what we can't do. He did what the law can't do. He did what Aaron couldn't do, the high priest. He's the only one who's pulled this off by that will, the will of God, and him doing the will of God completely, obediently, keeping all of the law, every one of the laws he kept, didn't break a one, but he also kept the will of God for him. I want you to go and die. He did it. And if he hadn't done it, again, we wouldn't be here. We have no reason to gather because we'd have no hope. But he did. And it means that we have everything taken care of once for all. And again, I started out with this. Those three words need to be seared into your brain pan. Once for all. What he did was once for all. There's no reason for Jesus Christ to die again. There's no reason that he should be crucified again for your sins. There's no reason for Jesus to do anything more because he did it once for all. And I need you to understand this. Your sins are completely forgiven. But I know you don't believe it because I don't believe it because they pop up every day. I keep sinning. Well, it doesn't say you'll never sin again. It says your sins are forgiven past, present, future. They're already forgiven. As soon as you commit them, they're forgiven. But wait, Ken, I, I thought it says, if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. It's already done. But you don't believe it and I don't believe it. We think if I confess, I get forgiveness. No, no, no. You confess because God has already forgiven you're just admitting that I have sinned, I have committed, just like David did. I have sinned against the Lord. And what did the prophet say? It's forgiven. See, that's amazing to me. I literally can walk into the presence of God completely forgiven, having just sinned. And it doesn't require my confession. The confession is based on the fact that I'm forgiven. I sinned and I'm forgiven. I, I can boldly come into his presence and confess what I've done, and I'm welcomed with open arms. That should blow you away. That should blow me away. And it's all because it's done. It's finished. It's once for all. And it lasts for eternity. Are you going to sin today? Sure. What are you going to do? I have no idea. You'll get clever. You'll come up with something. I will too. And it's forgiven. That, that's amazing to me. He already knows, and it's forgiven. And how far is that sin separated from God as far as the east is from the west? That's like infinite. That's the reality of what Jesus Christ does. It's totally sufficient, totally. I need nothing more. I don't add anything to this equation and it exceeds 
God's standard of righteousness, what he did. So why would I think that something I do would add to that and make God more satisfied than he already is? He's completely satisfied because his son did his will perfectly to the letter and his just and righteous anger is no longer hanging over my head. There is no more condemnation, Romans 8 says. No more condemnation, no more hatred, no more anger, no more wrath. I'm totally fully forgiven and my sins are totally atoned for. No matter what I do today, no matter what I do the rest of this year, my sins are completely paid and atoned for and I don't have to add anything to that fully, forever, once, for all. See, look at verse 10. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He puts it another way in verse 12. When Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. It's interesting in this passage, he talks about the high priest who would offer sacrifices and he would stand. And it's the picture of you're not done yet. You know, the high priest went into the Holy of Holies and he never sat down. He never had time to just kind of hang out with God, right? He stood and then he left and then he came back the next year and did the same thing. But it says that when Jesus entered into the Holy of Holies in heaven, he sat down at the right hand of God the Father because he's done. He's done with that aspect. He never has to do anything more. And it lasts for all time, once for all, for all time. Single sin, once for all, it's... It, How much more can he tell us? Well, verse 14, by a single offering, he is perfected for all time, those who are being sanctified. If you you see any other verse, see this one. It's for all time. Your sins have been taken care of for all time. Yeah, but Ken, what if I do X? Doesn't matter. What if I fail here? Doesn't matter. You have been sanctified. But notice he says, you are being sanctified. It's an ongoing process. You are right before God, but God in his mercy and his grace is still perfecting you. He's still setting you apart. He's still making you more and more like his son, but there is no more need for you to have your sins atoned for like in the old covenant because Jesus Christ did it all, never to be repeated, fully fully sufficient, all taken care of. And the reason we struggle with this, this guys, I think is because we live in an incomplete time when nothing is fully taken care of. It's like when you finally pay off the mortgage of your house, you think, oh, you know, my wife and I are really close. The problem is our house is over 30 years old and it's fallen apart. And so my mortgage may be taken care of, but I'm never done pouring money into that thing. It's never fully complete here, but with him, it is totally effective for how long? for all time. That's the amazing thing about this. And that's why the author wrote the book. And that's why the Holy Spirit inspired him to do it. And that's why it's in the canon of scripture. And that's why we're studying it. See, he tells us in verse 18, where there's forgiveness of these, there's no longer any offering for sin. There's nothing more you need to offer God. Nothing. Quit trying to please God. Quit trying to earn favor with God. Yes, live for him. Obey him, seek righteousness, study the word, but to get to know him better, not to try to win his favor. Because when you do that, you're trampling the blood of Christ. You're saying what he did is not enough. See, there's no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence that enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, in other words, we have access to the throne room of God because of the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. In other words, Jesus Christ has gone into the Holy of Holies in the heavenly tabernacle. He stands before the throne of God, the mercy seat upon which God Almighty stands, sits, and he went through the veil, his own body. He gave his life and that's the point of entry into God's presence. We go through the body and the blood of Christ. That's what the Lord's table is all about. We have entrance into God's throne room because of what Jesus Christ did. And we have a great high priest over the house of God. Who? Jesus Christ. See, there is a heavenly tabernacle. There is a holy of holies. There is a, a seat upon which Jesus sits, or God sits, the 
mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant, and we have access to it 24-7, 365 days a year, and it doesn't matter what you just did, what you just said, what you just watched. And again, I'm not diminishing the nature of sin. We should not sin. We should not pursue sin. We should put that behind us and move forward, but we need to understand that it never keeps us from having access to God. It doesn't because of what Jesus Christ did. And we can go in with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. See, this thing, this new covenant, this new atonement, this new sacrifice takes care of everything, our hearts and our bodies, not just the outside, like the old covenant, right? We, we talked about it, it can only purify the outside. This takes care of outside and inside, body and soul. It takes care of everything. We're sprinkled clean which means no more barriers. It's, a, it's amazing. If you go back and read Leviticus, there's so many laws concerning uncleanness. If you touch a dead animal, if you touch a dead human, if you get scabs on your, you know, anything happened to your skin, your outer body, you're, you can't come anywhere near God's tabernacle. You can't come anywhere near God until you're ceremonially clean. Guys, if, if we were limited coming into God's, throne room based on anything wrong with our outer flesh, we could never come into his throne room. You know, the very fact that your hair's falling out would keep you from having access to God. Well, that's, that's a bummer for me, right? It, it, the, the fact that you are overweight could keep you out of coming into the throne room of God. Well, that's a bummer for me too. Anything wrong with this physical body, any ailment, would keep you from coming into his presence. It's a barrier, but not anymore. Nothing can keep you out. Why? Because the veil's been torn. Ripped from bottom to top, according to Matthew. And by virtue of that, all my guilt has been removed. And yet, like I said last week, I carry it around in a black bag on my shoulder every day. Oh, God, what a loser I am. What a sinner I am. I'm, what a wretch I am. What a, what a this I am. What a that I am. And it got this, not in my eyes, buddy. Put the bag down. Come into my throne room. Spend time in my presence. Rejoice in who you are. Your heart is clean. Your outward body has been purified. I see you as fully righteous. And it's not just my heart. See, I, I look at this body and I go, God, why would you ever want me in your presence? And he goes, because you're mine and you've been paid for, you've been redeemed, you've been cleansed by the blood of my precious son. Come into my presence, even in your sinful state. Come on in, because your sins have been paid for once and for all. See, I love this. You may have never thought about this. We, we, we believe, we teach, we believe that when we come to faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live within us. Are you, really? He wants to live in here? See, I think I got to get, whoa, 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 I, I got to clean up the temple before the Holy Spirit can come in. No, he comes in in full forever at the point I accept Jesus Christ, which means that he must see this as a holy temple. He's not going to dwell somewhere that's not holy. Well, why would he see it as a holy temple if I still sin? He sees it because of the blood of Christ. Everything is based on the blood of Christ. That's what this whole section of Hebrews is all about. So with that in mind, that's really what this is all about. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Keep on keeping on. Don't waver. Don't go back. Don't turn around. Don't look for something else. For he who promised is faithful. Keep waiting on him to finish what he began. Hold on. Move forward. And then let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. I love this section of this letter because he's taking it away from the myopic, all about me, and he's saying, no, it's all about us. And again, we put you at tables because we want you to think about one another. You're not in this alone. This is not a solo sport. We are not lone rangers. We're in this together. We're like an army and we need one another to survive and thrive. He says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. See, if you're gonna hold fast, you need others to gather around you. And you need to gather them around so that you can hold them up and that they can hold you up and that we can move on together. So hold fast, stir up one another. Don't neglect meeting together. This is why we come together, guys. 
I love it that you're here, that you regularly come every Tuesday morning and you gather together and you're obeying this very thing, not neglecting meeting together as some do, but encouraging one another. See, we've got to encourage one another. I get down, you get down. I have bad days, you have bad days. And what I need is a brother in Christ to come alongside and say, hey, keep, hang in, keep moving, move forward, don't go backwards. I know you're struggling right now, but we're in this together and we will thrive and survive together. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. See, keep your eye on the prize. Focus on what's to come because he who promised always does what he says he's going to do. So hold on firmly. Trust in the promises of God. Value the community of other believers. Model your life after that of Christ. Live with the end in mind. This is what he's telling them. This is what he's telling you and I. And look for God's work in your circumstances. Guys, God is at work in so many amazing ways in your life. Some of you see it, some of you don't. And sometimes it takes a brother in Christ to come up and go, man, that's God. Did you notice how God, and you're like, really, that's God? I need someone to point that out to me on occasion. You need someone to point that out, that God is at work in your life. But see, if you do it alone, it doesn't work. If you try to be the lone ranger, you will fail. So he says, therefore, do not throw away your confidence. Hang on to it. It has a great reward don't miss how many times throughout this letter he has talked about the great reward, the great inheritance, the, the day that's coming, the, the return of Christ. That's the great reward for you have need of endurance. Why do you need endurance? Well, because you got to get to the end. First Peter talks about running the race. Every race has an end, right? That's why you run. Otherwise you're an idiot. Nobody runs a race without a a finish line, right? There's a, a race that has an end and you run with that in mind. You run with endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. That's why we run, guys, not willy-nilly, not running around like, I don't know where I'm going. Do you know where you're going? No, we run because we know there's an end in mind and one day we're gonna receive it. Yet a little while and the coming one will come and will not delay but my righteous one shall live by faith. That's what we live for. We live by faith based on the promise of God that one day he's coming. He says, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. This is not saying you're gonna shrink back. This is not saying you're gonna lose your salvation. He's comparing one thing to another. He's saying there are those who shrink back, but they never were saved to begin with. They never did truly believe. And I think some of the people to whom he's writing never fully believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And that's why they're going back to the old stuff. But see, those of us who've truly been saved will hold on. We will endure. Because what does he say? Verse 39, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their soul. That's not us. We are not those who shrink back. We will not go back. We will not give up. We will keep going forward. Why? Because he holds us in his hand and he will see us to the end. That's what this is all about. We are those who have faith. We are those whose lives will be kept by Jesus Christ. So it's a call to live as who you are, completely forgiven, welcoming God's presence, a full-fledged citizen of the kingdom of God, an integral part of the body of Christ. This is who you are. This is your reality. This is your identity. And you are the heir of a great reward. But do you believe it? And if you believe it, do you live like it? See, all of this is so important because we've skipped over a little chunk of verses. And, and sadly, they're some of the most memorable verses in the book of Hebrews. And in verses 26 through 30, and I'm just going to Look at them briefly, because I want you to understand they're, they're bookended by two great messages of, we've got hope. We've got hope. See, he gives them a word of warning. And this is not about losing your salvation. I need you to understand that. He's just writing that there are two groups of people in that church to whom he's writing. There are those who are truly saved and those who think they're saved, but they're not. They've hung around the church. They've, they've heard about the gospel. They've heard about Jesus Christ, this savior, and they've kind of believed in it, but not fully. They're just kind of hanging around the edges. They're posers. They're, they're wannabes. And they're in our church every Sunday. People who say they're Christians, but have never placed their faith in Jesus Christ. They've heard the gospel, but never fully accepted the gospel. 
They've witnessed the Spirit of God in this church. They've seen it in the lives of others, but it's never happened in their own life. They've seen life change, but in others, not them. And they learn to act like us. They learn to say the right things, and they go to all the right events, and they pray, and they worship, seemingly, and they sing the songs, but their hearts have not been changed. And literally what they're doing is legalism trying to earn favor with God through the behavior. Well, they go to church. I'm going to go to church. They sing the songs. I'm going to sing the songs. They give. I'm going to give. They show up at Bible study. I guess I'll go to Bible study. But they've never placed their faith in Jesus Christ. And they're going to shrink back because their faith is not genuine. But see, he says, that's not us. They risk God's judgment, but not you, not me. I know this about me. I'm flawed but I'm never going to shrink back. I'm never going back because I'm strong. No, because my God is faithful. So here's your questions for this morning. What encouraged you the most about this lesson and how will it change your perspective? I hope something encouraged you out of all that we just looked at, but how's it going to change the way you live your life today, tomorrow, next week, next year, and through the end of your life until the Lord returns? How should the once for all nature of Christ's sacrifice alter the way we view our sin? You, like me, hang on to your sins like a dog with a rag. It's time to let them go. Quit living with guilt. Quit living as if your sins separate you from God. Run into his presence and enjoy his forgiveness. Finally, according to verses 32 through 34, how should faith in the kingdom to come help us survive the trials that come with life in a fallen world? We live in a fallen world it's hard. It can be difficult, but how will we not just thr- survive, but thrive based on those verses? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your message of hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Father, I pray today that you would help us to understand that our sins are fully forgiven. We've been fully atoned for. Our guilt has been removed as far as the east is from the west, that we have full access into your presence. We are your children. We are heirs of your kingdom. We have everything coming to us because of what Christ has done for us. There's nothing more we need to do. So Father, would you sear that into our brains? Would you help us to understand and rejoice in the reality of our atonement, our redemption, our salvation, our sanctification, our ultimate glorification, and the fact that we have a great inheritance awaiting us. And we pray all of this in Jesus Christ's name, amen.